Good morning, and welcome to the MPO meeting. Will everyone please rise for the pleasure of allegiance and invocation? Our gracious and heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you allow us to come out today to discuss the business of this county as we all work, whether you're on this desk, at this day, as our, in the audience, to make this county a better place for all of us to live, work, and play. We ask that you uh, humble our hearts and regulate our minds as we make these decisions. Father, we ask that you put your loving arms around and protect those that put on uniforms and protect us each and every day, whether the military uniforms or first responders. We ask that you take them back to their homes after their duty is done to find everything safe and sound. And when our work is done here today, we ask you to take us back to our home to find everything safe and sound. These are all blessings we ask in your righteous and holy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. You have the minutes from the March 11, 2019 uh, meeting. Do you have a motion to approve those minutes? Uh, motion by Commissioner Kemp, second by Councilmember Maniscalco to approve those minutes. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed likewise. Motion's adopted. This morning is the last meeting for one of our members. Um, I hate to see him go. Uh, he's been an asset not only to this board, but to the city of Tampa as a member of the Tampa City Council, uh, who's worked very hard uh, to make this place a better place for all of us to live, work, and play. Um, he speaks loud sometimes, <laughs> but when he does, everyone listens because he has a great things to say. And I'm talking about Councilman Harry Cohen. Uh, he leaves office May 1st, this is his last day. And this uh, MPO would like to recognize you and honorably present it to uh, Councilman Harry Cohen on April 2nd, 2019 in recognition and appreciation of his temporary service as you served on the MPO Board as a Vice Chair, on the MPO Policy Committee as Chairman, the MPO Chair's Count, uh, Coordinating Committee, the Tampa Disadvantaged Coordinating Board, and the Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area Leadership Group. We thank you for your leadership and dedication from 2011 to 2019. Councilman Cohen, we're gonna, you're going to be missed. We wish you the very best in your future endeavors, whatever that may be. Um, maybe you'll come back and see us in four years. I don't know. But I uh, want to present this to you. Thank you. Anything you want to say? I, well, I just want to say thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to serve on this board. And um, I just congratulate everyone because I know that you have very important work ahead of you uh, in the years to come with all of the challenges facing our county and I know that um, with your leadership and and the the brain power of everyone assembled in this room will do just great so thank you thank you sir I'll be joining you in 19 months um, <laughs> so uh, again uh, Council McCoy thank you very much I also you. want to say congratulations to uh, mr. Cameron Clark uh, he became a new father this weekend so, baby girl. How much sleep did you get last night? About three and a half. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> but again, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, public comment. I have some, some cards here somewhere. We're moving to public comments. You have three minutes for public comment. Uh, the first person to make the public comment is uh, Mr. Chris Vila. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Chris Vela, Ybor City, Tampa, Florida, you all know me. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the meeting that we just had over at Seminole Heights in regards to segment seven, uh, which is the area north of the I-4 that runs uh, right about to Barris. Um, really concerned about this project because half of it, or a portion of it, is actually included in SEIS. I don't know why FDOT wants to accelerate and push a segment forward. That's a big problem. As you know, back in January, I was here. I warned this board about the segment seven and the work plan. Unfortunately, you guys approved it. So now we had to waste a lot of people's time coming out to some heights and to say that they want no build. We could have avoided this altogether. We could have asked, hey, what if we take $300 million, send it back, reallocate it, repackage it to use for CSX? Again, I don't know these things to me, I guess, are apparent, but um, I just hope that you guys take a quick, a good look at the work plan and some of your documents to realize that we just don't have to go this far. Um, one of the things about segment seven, too, is even though we're, out, we're only adding um, 
you know, the additional lane and we have that shoulder, there's no guarantee that FTOT's gonna say it's gonna be no toll forever. So there, there's, as we see with other projects, that can change. We saw that with HOV to toll lanes a long time ago, just throughout the nation. And now we're seeing the right of way being privatized and double toed, tolled or tax on Flor Floridians. Um, the other concern that I have too is that I recently lost a property. Well, I didn't, but my neighborhood did on 12th Avenue. It was an old uh, quadplex over there. Um, it's actually the photos in the Library of Congress. That got tore down while we were in this uh, TB Next process. And so now I'm dealing with a lot more blight in my neighborhood. And what I mean by that is a lot of empty spaces. We're in a landmark historic district in Ybor City. Um, and so right now I'm working with FDOT. I'm trying to get some lighting out there and it's the best I can do. The best I can do is put pole lighting in my historic neighborhood in Ybor City and see homes go away. So this stuff is occurring right now, which is why I'm asking you guys to kill this project immediately. And you guys have the power to do that anytime you want. Anytime you guys meet up in the sport meeting, you can stop this project because I'm tired of seeing bits of my neighborhood being lost. And I'm tired of being blighted. Um, and another quick thing too, we're going back to the letters again. As you know, I tried to warn this board a couple months ago about the letter to Senator Roussan to approve the West Shore interchange uh, work that was gonna add toll lanes and um, more capacity. As you know, uh, the Suncoast Parkway too is linked to the veterans, which is linked to us. If we do toll lanes in the West Shore area, it's only gonna justify this project. We saw it with the I-4 to be um, the ultimate I-4, which is 2.3 billion. Now we're seeing a $5.8 billion project called Beyond the Ultimate I-4. FDOT never gets enough. They just wanna keep on going. So we need to change the conversation and stop this now. Thank you. Sure. Rick Fernandez. Good morning. Good morning. Rick Fernandez, 2906 North Elmore. Good morning to all of you. Um, uh, for starters, I want to incorporate by reference Chris's comments. I agree with all of them, so that'll save us all a little bit of time. Um, you might look at this as a preview of the uh, tip review to take place in June. I'm starting to kind of build myself up for the Super Bowl again uh, since we do this once a year. Um, and I intend to come here as often as I can between now and, and June 11, I believe the date is, to continually ask you to take action to remove any remnant of TBX from the tip. It seems that, you know, we can, we can say it once a year. I'm thinking maybe if I say it three, four, or five times a year, maybe it'll take because it never seems to go away. Um, last year, I told you that TBX was not dead, all rumors to the contrary notwithstanding. Uh, it has, in fact, been broken into component parts. Um, it's filed away in the TIP document as it appeared last year at Table 2, priority number 32. If you uh, comb your way through the line items of that section, you will see all the independent parts of TBX there. In particular, uh, Section 4, which is the West Shore Interchange, Section 6, which is the Downtown Interchange, and Section 7, which is the, uh, the section under PD&E review now, which is, as Chris suggested, the portion of 275 corridor north of downtown, up to the Beers uh, apex area. Um, I am asking uh, this board uh, again and finally to remove section six from the tip, that is reference number 1005 in the tip document from last year, section seven, from the tip, that is again the subject uh, area under study that Chris mentioned that was part of the public hearing in uh, Seminole Heights last week and it was very well attended and you would have been hard pressed to find anyone in the building which was standing room only or probably within a quarter mile of it who would be in support of that project. And why? For some reasons that Dr. Wong is going to be coming up here to tell us about later because it's not good for our health to have corridors of this type running through our urban core. And uh, frankly, it's inconsistent with our presumed effort to avoid projects that are related to capacity. We're supposed to be moving away from capacity projects that put more cars on the road. And yet, on the same day at the CAC last month when Johnny Wong presents his uh, state of the system that tells us that, FDOT comes in to tell us that they want to add capacity to the primary quarter 
on 275 right through the middle of our neighborhood. So uh, please, no to Section 6, no to Section 7. Finally put these, uh, these projects to rest. See you next month. <laughs> Kevin O'Hare. Hi, good morning. Kevin O'Hare, 4931 Copper Canyon Boulevard, Valrico. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, in regards to your consent agenda, uh, this uh, MPO body will be approving the interlocal agreement for the full implementation of the all for transportation sales <coughs> tax. I'm here on behalf of them this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to seeing this passage go through. Uh, this is a very exciting moment. The MPO is going to be a critical partner in the uh, interlocal agreement and making sure that the IOC is fully staffed. Uh, and being represented uh, with some good working folks uh, here at the MPO. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That's the last speaker's card I have. Is anyone else? Why were you late? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. That's Ron Weaver, folks. He's Why are you dueling on the side of your car there? Let's just <laughs> Those are advanced notes. Okay. <laughs> Morning. Uh, the late Ronald Weaver. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> wanted to hear that for a long time. Um, 401 East Jackson Street. I'm a member of a couple of uh, boards and a co chairman of a couple of transportation committees, but those groups need to formulate their position on the subjects just discussed by two former speakers. So I'm here as a citizen, but quite frankly, I have five questions for you this morning. Number one, is it true that by 2045, Interstate 275 north of downtown Tampa is going to be 245% of capacity? By 2045, is the interstate north, I-275, north of downtown, going to be what I think we've been told, which is 245% of capacity. Not 120, not 180, not 200, but 245% of capacity. I res we respect the neighbors' concerns, and I was at that hearing, and there were indeed 30 people who spoke for no build, and they spoke eloquently with magnificent reasons. But we need to hear from the rest of the community with respect to whether or not I-275 north of downtown is or is not going to be involved in toll roads, which it appears that they are, at least for now, not intended to be toll roads, as I understand the presentation made by the DOT at the Seminole Heights presentation last week. Number two, I understand there is little to no additional right-of-way going to be taken vis-a-vis -vis disruption of those neighborhoods vis-a-vis -vis additional right-of-way and that there will be little or no additional right-of-way taken in order to achieve the $300 million preferred alternative of one lane in each direction added to Interstate 275 north of downtown regarding that 2045, 242% of capacity. Third question, are we, or are we not going to have a boulevard? And if we're ever going to have a boulevard, will it or will it not? solve some of these problems or make some of them worse? What will it do to Florida? What will it do to Nebraska? What will it do to the connectivity of everything north of downtown toward the interstate? Number four, when will we have CSX's uh, viability? Is it five years? Is it 15 years? Is it, is it 500 million? Is it 2 billion? Where are we going to get it from? With or without the lawsuit vis-a-vis -vis all four transportation, thank you, Janet and others, for the all four transportation, $302 million. But when will we have rail? And how long can we survive on I-275 North for commerce, for tourists, and everything else it takes in order to function as a region until we get CSX and we get rail and the lawsuit is over and we spend the $302 million a year of all four transportation vis-a-vis -vis connecting downtown and the University of South Florida and New Tampa and Wiregrass and the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Appreciate it very much. Is anyone else wishing to speak before us this morning? Okay, thank you very much. If there's a staff member somewhere, could they come and see about the air in this room? It's pretty warm. Uh, so, so. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you. Um, committee re reports online and comments. Ms. Uh, Torres, good morning. Good morning. Gina Torres, MPO staff. Uh, the MPO committees forward for your approval the 2018 State of the System report on your action items today. <coughs> Great. Good timing for that. <coughs> the Policy Committee approved and forwarded the interlocal agreement regarding transportation sales surtax on your consent agenda and the letter to the Bay Area Legislative Delegation, which is similar to one that Pinellas, Ford Pinellas uh, also sent. The committees heard reports on the Tampa Smart Cities Initiative. The CAC heard a presentation by Joshua Frank. <clears throat> on the I-275 Boulevard conversion project, and members were 
we're asking how freeway conversion projects have been accomplished in other cities. <clears throat> the TAC participated in an activity to identify additional major projects to be included in the regional model for testing their effect on congestion for the 2045 LRTP needs assessment. The policy committee had a similar discussion, plus they also discussed the multi-use trails projects and the process for public engagement this summer. The Tampa Bay Next I-275 Section 7 update was presented uh, to the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee and their members feel this is an unsustainable project and that other alternatives should be considered. The MPO directors met at T-BARDA's office and were briefed on T-BARDA's next steps to, to develop the Regional trans Transit Development Plan. Uh, the MPO's Long Range Transportation Plan updates will collaborate with T-BARDA for public outreach and ridership forecasting. The next meeting of the MPO's chairs will be July 19th in Pasco County and topics will include regional priorities, revisions to the CCC interlocal agreement for streamlining the regional process and an overview of the Pasco Connected Cities project, Connected City. Uh, those were your committee reports and I'll just move on to the online comments. We had a uh, couple of emails. Carmen Monroy, the DOT Director of Policy Planning, complimented the Planning Commission and the MPO on the extensive coordination in creating the 2018 Plan Hillsborough Annual Report. Ken Size submitted public comment on the well-documented effects of roundabouts. The Federal Highway back in 2001 cited 90% reduction in fatalities. Now PennDOT has come out uh, using 17 years of crash data and found modern roundabouts to be 100% effective in eliminating fatalities at intersections where those were built. Patrick Post shared a proposal for 200-mile solar-powered light rail commuter train system with a bike ped pathway and electric bike share, car share from Marco Island to Tampa International Airport. Uh, Mauricio Rosas shared two articles from the Brookings Institute. One suggested economic su success should also measure worker and family well well-being like their standards of living and household incomes. The more common broad brush figures on jobs and employment vary dramatically across our diverse communities um, in, the, in American lives. The second article focused on the importance of shifting to building great places instead of the attention given to solving traffic congestion. Mr. Rosas also wrote to thank Secretary Gwynn for his continued cooperation in the face of a frustrated community. And he asked for clarification on a few completion dates of studies such as Hart's arterial BRT and the height study. Those are your emails. We had a couple, uh, two individuals had Facebook posts in this this is your last uh, part of the online comments. Rick Fernandez posted about his review of the interlocal agreement and the county charter amendment. He noted several conflicts and ambiguities, especially related to the IOC's powers and duties. The charter provides the IOC the power to approve or disapprove agency project plans and allocate expenditure categories and suspension of distributions for agencies' noncompliance. By comparison, the interlocal does not make reference to the IOC's voting and oversight provisions and adds the involvement of a professional engineer to certified project compliance. Uh, the interlocal suggests an effort to limit the powers and duties of the IOC and substitute with the opinions of a professional engineer instead of the independent voting and findings of the IOC. Mr. Fernandez also made two requests related to the minutes of the February board meeting regarding the TMA leadership recommendations for the annual priority projects. He writes that the 275 operational improvements from north of downtown to the apex is, if that's the preferred alternative project advanced by DOT, secondary to the pd &E, he requests this item to be removed from the list of top priorities. And he noted during public comment that Doug Jessup on behalf of Seminole Heights and himself on behalf of Tampa Heights, stood to oppose the DOT's preferred alternative for Section 7 and advocate for no build. He says that the minutes uh, did not reflect those comments. Lastly, Mauricio Rosas posted regarding the DOT hearing, and he offered these points to begin and establish a completion date for the Heart BRT study for Florida, Fowler, Tampa, and Nebraska Avenues, finish the Heights Mobility Study, prioritize CSX studies and projected completion, prioritize all non-interstate Vision Zero improvements, Keep Section 7 as its own separate project. Develop a boulevard concept as part of the long-term transit plan. Do not add general use lanes. Consider reduced speeds on I-275 by time of day. And invest in expanding local bus service and preserve the Florida Bra Florida Nebraska exit. Uh, uh, those full comments are in your folders. I just summarized them. Any questions? Commissioner Smith, to recognize. Um, I'd like to ask about one of Rick Fernandez's comments. Um, possibly uh, <coughs> Mr. Clark can help. Um, <coughs> about this uh, it, this language in the interlocal agreement and how it does or doesn't limit the IOC, particularly um, 
uh, the part that says the IOC is to approve and certify in reliance upon uh, the professional engineer or, or else the, uh, I think the Hart board added a um, procurement specialist. So uh, the language approve and certify in reliance upon these additional professionals added to the process by the MOU. Um, what happens if the IOC disagrees with that professional? Board members, um, just for a bit of background, um, we, I mean, I participated with the attorneys for the implementing agencies and also the attorney for the clerk, so the city, <coughs> part, uh, the county, um, all had our uh, lawyers get together to craft an agreement um, about how this uh, would operate. Um, the main func purpose of the agreement is to sort of add meat to the bone of the uh, charter amendment because there's some uh, provisions in there. Um, that really aren't addressed in the amendment. Uh, for instance, um, administrative support for the I, um, IOC is not addressed, and uh, they, the agency has worked out a solution to that. Um, legal counsel, other, other things of that nature. For purposes <laughs> of the MPO, um, there's, uh, the MPO's limited involvement with the IOC. They're gonna pr provide staff support, but MPO doesn't submit project plans to the IOC, and they don't appoint a member to the IOC. Um, so uh, what the main function of the, those meetings were to sort of flesh out these issues to add some provisions um, and some standards of review that weren't addressed in the IOC, um, I'm sorry, in the uh, charter, in the, um, in the ILA. So um, the, the attorneys for the agencies all worked on this together and came up with language that they believe was consistent with uh, the charter amendment and agreeable to all the parties involved. Um, it's worth noting that at the end of the um, interlocal, however, um, I think it might be the very last provision. I'm sorry, yes, it's in, it's actually right above section nine, the end of section eight. There's a provision that specifically addresses if there's any conflicts between the ILA and the Charter Amendment that the Charter Amendment takes precedence. So it acknowledges that in the, in the um, uh, that if, if that possibility was to arise, it obviously the Charter Amendment controls, um, but this was the language that was crafted by the, uh, by the parties, and I believe it went to the Heart Board yesterday. I think it's going to the VOCC tomorrow, so it's on the agendas now for all the agencies to approve. And so, um, the, in reliance in this, in this MOU, um, it, it, does that restrict the IOC to agreeing with the engineer or, uh, um, the, I mean, my question is what, what happens if they disagree? It, well, I believe the, um, the intent behind the uh, language about the engineer and procurement professional was that the implementing agencies are going to use um, engineers and procurement professionals to ensure that what they submit to the IOC is, um, uh, is complying with the intent of the Charter Amendment. I don't believe it constrains the, the abilities of the IOC, um, and I don't think the intent was to do that. that. That was my reading, but I wanted to hear it from an attorney. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Move the consent agenda. We have four items on the consent agenda. Uh, what's your pleasure? Mo a motion by Commissioner Kemp, second by uh, Councilman Scalco to approve the consent agenda. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed is likewise. Motion is adopted. Action items. 2018 State of the System Report. Mr. Wong. Good morning. Good morning, MPO board members. Thank you. Johnny Wong, MPO staff, I'm here to present you with the 2018 State of the System Report. The 2018 State of the System Report is a required element in our long range plan update, and it's one of the building blocks that will feed into the development of our. Uh, cost feasible plan. It looks at all of the money that's available for transportation. It assesses how much is being spent in certain program areas and it measures essentially what we're getting for the amount of money that we spend in each of these areas. The report includes all of the federally required targets and performance measures, but we've also gone beyond what is required to include some additional measures which reflect what's important at the local level. There are performance measures specific to each of the MPO's five program areas, which are shown on the screen. And as we move through the presentation, I'll kind of explain what each of those program areas covers. So the first program area is called State of Good Repair and Resiliency, and it includes pavement, bridges, transit assets, and resiliency projects. Beginning with pavement, there are more than 12,000 lane miles of road within Hillsborough County, 
but the measure on this screen only applies to the lane miles on the National Highway System, or the NHS. We are currently not meeting the statewide goal for percent of interstate pavement in good condition. That goal is 60%, and we're currently at 51%. But we are meeting the statewide goal for performance on the National Highway System arterials. And compared to other major metro areas across the state, the condition of our pavement is about average. Jacksonville, Miami, and Sarasota Manatee have better interstate pavement than we do, while Orlando's is worse. And Miami and Orlando have better arterial pavement than we do, while Jacksonville and Sarasota Manatee have worse. The National Highway System roads are assessed using a scale which is specific to that network. So the scale that's used to assess NHS roads can't be used to assess the condition of our local roads. Thankfully, all of the local jurisdictions assess their pavement using the same scale called the Pavement Condition Index. And the index values range from 0 to 100. Um, 1 is represented on this map in the dark green, and a score of 100 indicates freshly laid pavement, like paved yesterday, so it's in absolute perfect condition. A 0 would be akin to like a dirt road almost. The local jurisdictions, most of them anyway, have a target of resurfacing roads when they get to that light green, yellowish color. Um, resurfacing any time before that could be uh, not prioritizing their resurfacing <coughs> funds in the best way, and deferring beyond that makes uh, resurfacing slightly more costly in the long term. The second element of state of good repair is bridge maintenance. Our national highway system bridges are currently exceeding the statewide goals by a fairly wide margin. And compared to other major metro areas across the state, our NHS bridges rank toward the top with only Orlando performing better and Miami, Jacksonville, and Sarasota performing worse. There are more than 750 bridges in Hillsborough County and 14% of them are either in poor condition or don't meet the needs of current traffic conditions. This could mean that they're more prone to flooding or they're not, um, they're not suitable to withstand the traffic demands. We have estimated that the total cost to repair or replace those 14% of bridges that are categorized as either functionally obsolete or structurally deficient is about $31 million per year, but the current budgets only provide funding for about half of that. The third element in this program is transit asset maintenance. And the current capital improvements programs show a focused effort to invest in repairing and replacing the fleet. Over the next five years, the annual investment will be about $12 million per year, which is 40% more than the baseline identified in our Imagine 2040 Long Range Plan. Included in that $12 million is money that the MPO prioritizes for HART every year. So we give them about $4 million for bus replacements roughly one quarter of our uh, surface transportation funds. And also included in that is $10 million that we helped HART get to replace the CAT AVL vehicle, traffic, uh, vehicle tracking technology. If this investment level continues, HART should be able to maintain average bus age of less than the Federal Transit Administration standard of 12 years, uh, which works out to the likelihood of mechanical failures dropping pretty dramatically. And finally, the capital budgets also reflect a focus on improving resiliency in the county. Over the next five years, an average of $46 million will be spent on canal dredging and upgrading and replacing culverts to alleviate road flooding. Uh, also included in this budget is a fairly large project in South Tampa to study, model, and construct a regional watershed to help address some of the chronic flooding that you see on the peninsula. Our second program area is Vision Zero and this focuses exclusively on improving safety. During the evaluation period for this state of the system update, we experienced the single most fatal year in all of Hillsborough County. In 2016, we had 226 traffic fatalities, and the previous record was 225 in 1990. Programs like Vision Zero and others have allowed us to make significant reductions in 2017 and 2018, so that number dropped uh, fairly significantly but it's clear that sustained investments are needed if we're gonna continue that downward trend. Compared to other major metro areas across the state, we perform average to poor. Our fatal crash rate per vehicle miles traveled is second only to Miami, and our injury rate is in the middle. We're worse than Jacksonville and Miami, but better than Orlando and Sarasota Manatee. 
Finally, there's also an equity component to Vision Zero. Based on historical crash data, we found that residents living in a disadvantaged community are 20% more likely to be involved in a severe crash than those who don't. To reduce those numbers across the board, we have a goal to reduce crashes 3.4% every year, which is aggressive, but it becomes possible with the addition of surtax funds dedicated to safety projects. Our third program area is called Smart Cities, and this focuses on reducing congestion and improving reliability using operational strategies to improve traffic flow. Many segments of our interstate network are operating reliably. However, the portions that run through the urban core are moderately to severely unreliable. Over the next five years, the jurisdictions will invest nearly $60 million per year to improve reliability and reduce congestion. And some of those projects include signal upgrades, communication devices, geometric improvements to intersections, and allocating additional resources to help improve incident clearance time on the interstates. Another aspect of smart cities is reducing exposure to vehicle emissions. The map to the right of this slide shows that one in five Hillsborough County residents lives within 300 meters of a high volume roadway, and one in nine lives only 150 meters away from a high volume roadway. This places us at two and a half times the national average. Um, the national average for population living within 300 meters of a high volume roadway is 4%. In Hillsborough County, we're at 11%, which makes it all the more important to reduce idling time and implement mitigation measures like noise walls and vegetation to help reduce exposure to particulates that are coming off of uh, tailpipes on these high volume roadways. There's also an equity component to smart cities. Your chance of being exposed to emissions from high volume roads is 13% higher if you're a community of concern resident in Hillsborough County. That exposure can have negative health effects, including adult asthma. 9.2% of Hillsborough County's adult population has asthma, which is the highest rate among metro areas across the state, according to the health department. Fourth program area is real choices when not driving, and this focuses on providing transportation alternatives beyond the single occupant vehicle. On average, about 14% of residents have access to good bus service, 20% have access to good pedestrian facilities, and 9% have access to good trails and side paths. 37% of our jobs are located within a quarter mile of good bus service, 39% within a quarter mile of good pedestrian facilities, and about a quarter near good bike facilities. This means that the majority of our good multimodal facilities are clustered around um, economic areas uh, which have higher densities of employment. The map on this slide shows transit level of service across the county using a new methodology that we recently created. The green represent lines which have service frequency of one bus every 10 to 15 minutes or about four to six buses per hour. And this reflects the goals of HART's 2017 Mission, Mission Max redesign, which was intended to deliver more efficient service by increasing frequencies on some of the highly used routes um, and therefore reducing trip times. And the data that we collected from HART reflects this, well, reflects the goal of Mission Max. While the longer term results of Mission Max remain to be seen, we looked at historical data and we see that on-time performance has increased year after year. Uh, on-time performance means that the bus is either one minute early or five minutes late. And we would only expect that trend to continue with more frequent service. Physical health of residents is an important consideration for transportation choice and livability. We know that obesity is a problem in our community and good multimodal facilities can help tackle that in two ways, both by encouraging activity and also by connecting residents to health-related destinations. For the average resident who relies on walking or cycling as their primary mode of transportation, about one-third of all of our hospitals, grocery stores, and schools are near good pedestrian or bike facilities. For transit riders, however, those numbers aren't quite as good. Only 9% of schools, 20% of grocery stores, and 18% of hospitals are accessible via um, good facilities. But 
Th uh, this is a program which is being invested in. Over the next five years, the jurisdictions will, in will invest over $550 million to improve access to those good facilities, which is 70% more than the baseline that we identified in our 2040 long range plan. Finally, our major projects program includes capacity projects which can help facilitate economic growth. Capacity projects are defined as widening or extending major roads or building new fixed guideway transit systems. Um, we've recently completed our socioeconomic data as part of our update to the 2045 long range plan. And we found that by 2045, our, po our population is projected to increase by 40% which will, which will undoubtedly generate greater congestion on our roads. In the last long range plan update, we found that more than half of our major road network was scoring at a level of service F, and that's due to growth in the, re the resulting congestion. So it's clear that this problem is going to get worse, which makes it all the more important to be strategic about how we address that problem, because we're never gonna have enough resources to add travel lanes to all of the um, highly congested network, uh, which is why the MPO's list of capacity needs is screened both by the level of congestion and by proximity to employment centers. Um, this works out so that the costliest projects are focused on corridors serving at least 5,000 jobs and major roads which are beyond full capacity. Over the next five years, more than $1 billion will be invested to add network capacity by widening corridor extensions and constructing or reconstructing interchanges. And this is an action item. Um, we would like for the board to establish these performance metrics that we've reported as our baseline by which to assess projects in the forthcoming 2045 long range plan update and therefore approve the 2018 state of the system report. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. And we have a motion first, and then we'll get into discussion. We'll motion by Commissioner Kemp. Second. second. by Who's that? Second. Mr. Mechanic. Uh, now we're moving to discussion. Are there any questions? Any questions? Um, I, I just <clears throat> yes. have a comment. Um, I, it's an interesting, really huge report. I thought that there was, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but I thought I looked at it, and there was, some pages that were on the original that we got that um, weren't there, some slides. And um, one of them, I, I just think it's worth pointing out <laughs> um, with the Vision Zero that um, one thing is, I know that this is the protocol that we compare to other Florida cities for our measurements, but I just think it's important that everybody understand that seven of the 10 most dangerous metro areas in the entire nation are Florida cities. So when we compare ourselves to Florida cities and say we're here or there, we're actually very doing very, very, very poorly. Um, so I just want that, I mean, the bar is low on, on comparing ourselves to other Florida metro areas. So I think that that's important. But this one of the slides that was missing that was interesting to me, or that I think, maybe I saw it somewhere else, but I thought it was part of this, um, was um, it, and it showed the peak in 2016 for the crash and deaths and in Vision Zero fatalities um, and injuries, I think also, um, which I thought was interesting that that was being tracked, a uh, serious injury. But at any rate, so it showed it going down in the last two years, which um, is very good, obviously. But what went down were the crashes for cars and the motorcycle crashes. And what remained static is the bicycle and pedestrian um, on that. And I know it's harder to ratchet down the bicycle and pedestrian because there are uh, fewer and um, our infrastructure hasn't addressed that. But I just, I just wanted to uh, note that because they were absolutely flat lines for pedestrian bicycle, whereas the crashes had really I'm pleased had um, kind of uh, pretty pretty substantially started to drop. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think we collected data from 2011 and then projected it all the way through to 2021 so that we had roughly 10 years of data. And while the traffic fatalities due to automobiles and motorcycles went down from the high of 2016, the pedestrian and cycle crashes and uh, injuries and fatalities have basically stayed the same for a 10-year period. We do have a more detailed report on the uh, crash trends later on the agenda. 
Okay, and maybe, maybe that's what I, I saw. I just didn't want it to go by because I thought I had seen it in this presentation. Mr. Smith, you recognize. Thank you. There's a, it is a big re report with a lot of data in it, um, and much of it is pretty grim. Um, uh, how how uh, poorly the roads are performing now, um, how little hope we have for uh, doing uh, uh, better uh, quickly in a lot of respects. And I think this highlights the need and importance for the uh, MPO to be working closely with the Planning Commission and our County Commission in terms of growth management because that's the that's the other place we can hope to um, to ease the worsening of this as we try to um, to address it with uh, the new surtax funding and and uh, new technology and new infrastructure as best we can. We also have to uh, keep from worsening the problem with the sprawl patterns of the past and, and be directing growth to transit-oriented development and smart growth options. And so uh, putting, putting people where the, the infrastructure is better and, and really doing a better job of, uh, I mean, changing direction entirely. From, uh, from continuing to worsen the problem the way our, our past um, growth management has led us into this problem. Oh, Mayor Gerardo, you recognize. Um, just a quick question. On one of your slides, you commented um, that 14% have access to good um, bus service. And I think a couple slides later, and we're focusing on business corridors, 5,000 or more, and that, so the business sector is well covered but getting out to homes. So how are we defining um, good bus service? Is it the availability? Is it, as Commissioner Smith said, is it about sprawl? Is it timeliness of service? How is that access to good service being defined? Because 14% seems pretty abysmal. There are people who are more versed in the methodology. What I know is that we looked at the percent of the population that's within a quarter mile of a stop that has service running every 10 to 15 minutes. I think that there are additional factors, but that's the one that I'm most familiar with. So it's really looking at frequency and um, more or less like how long you have to wait for the next bus to come. Commissioner Oldman, you recognize. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Uh, clearly, as Commissioner Smith mentioned, we are a um, long way from digging ourselves out of fixing our congestion problem with using roads. So I'm, I'm looking at the slides to talk about our congestion areas, the air quality, as well as our uh, crash ratios. And it becomes pretty obvious that if we're not looking at other alternatives, such as using rail uh, and additional bus alternative services to those areas, such as hospitals and schools and grocery stores, uh, we are not going to widen our, ourselves into a solution no matter how much money we have. So I'm curious, um, you know, when do we start looking at our state of the system that includes the concept of including the existing rail lines that run through our county as part of our projections? I think that the um, passenger load on rail corridors is something that we're looking at for modeling the 2045 long range plan. Um, I'm only, I only know enough to answer like very superficial questions. So if you have something more detailed, I'm gonna have to pass it off to maybe Beth or Sarah. But that's certainly something that we're looking at. I think uh, honestly, given the state of our system, it's very clear that we have to do something other than what we have been doing and expecting a different result. But thank you very much for the detail. It's really helpful to see where our greatest weaknesses are um, and, and give us some direction on where we take our policy. So thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? We have a motion by Commissioner Kemp, second by Commissioner McKinney to establish performance and baseline and approve the 2018 state of the system. See no further discussion. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Likewise, <laughs> motion is adopted. Mr. Wong, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark. Recognize, sir. 
which is the executive director's annual evaluation. Good morning. Thank you, board members. Uh, this is the uh, annual evaluation for the executive director, Ms. Alden. Um, I submitted uh, forms, and, and just for the record, uh, just to start, policy committee discussed the form of the evaluation and determined to change formats this year. Um, the format, uh, really easily usable format here, is uh, actually uh, comes from HART, so those who are on that board are probably already familiar with it. Um, but I sent this out to members, got a good number of responses. What I've done with uh, your attachment here is there's a total of eight categories with subsections in each category. Uh, board members are asked to uh, rank between uh, one and five, uh, five being the high-end score um, on these categories. What I did was I uh, averaged the um, scores of all the mem uh, board members who submitted. That's what you're seeing on your form there. So you have an average for each sub-question and an average for each category. At the end, I also added any comments that uh, board members made for each category and also overall comments uh, that the board members wish to make. Um, the overall results were um, <clears throat> all between, actually were between three and four, but closer to an overall of four than to three. Um, as part of this item, all I'd ask is uh, a board vote to receive the evaluation. Um, and that's all for you, unless you have any questions. Any questions, Mr. Clark? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Kemp, second by um, Councilman Escalco to receive the report. Any further discussion? Saying none, all those in favor, let me know by saying aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. <clears throat> Motion is adopted. Thank you, sir. Moving to status reports. Soranita, Plan Hillsborough Annual Report. Good morning. Good morning, Melissa Zornita, Executive Director of the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. Thank you for having me here today. I've got a quick update on some of the projects we've been working on over the last year. Um, as you all are aware, the Planning Commission provides staff support to the MPO and to the Hillsborough River Board. Um, and we also serve all four local governments in their long range planning needs. Um, just a couple of quick numbers. We've seen a definite uptick in the number of things like plan amendments and rezonings that we are evaluating. You all are probably experiencing that in your um, board meetings in, in each of the jurisdictions. Um, but we're also proud of things like the number of responses that we were able to receive to the It's Time Tampa Bay survey, over 9,500 there, and that uh, collectively as an agency, we've secured $260,000 of new grant funding. In terms of our comprehensive planning focus, um, we have done a number of proactive amendments to the comprehensive plan. We've been focused um, in the city of Tampa on looking at a land use category called the Transitional Use 24 that has um, sort of seen its viability decrease. And so looking at that and ways to move that into a more viable land use categories. Um, and we've also established a new online plan amendment database to make uh, comprehensive plan amendments easier for the public to search on our website. Um, in terms of transportation and land use uh, collaboration, this is a big focus of our agency, given our support both of the Planning Commission and the MPO. Um, as Mr. Wong stated, we have been working on the population employment projections looking out to 2045 so that those are available to support the Long Range Transportation Plan. Um, we've recently completed a study of Fowler Avenue and the land use patterns along there and what might be some um, recommendations to improve that pattern. Uh, we also did a similar study of the North Alexander Street uh, corridor, which is a new corridor in Plant City. Um, we've looked at an assessment of our rural land use um, patterns in the East County, East Rural County uh, section. And we've been working with the MPO staff on health and all policies, specifically with some policy language to go into the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Um, some of our strategic initiatives, um, you all participated with us in our first ever strategic plan to support all three boards um, last year. Uh, we also have about a quarter of our agency retiring in the next five years, so we've been spending a lot of time on um, institutional knowledge, cross-training, um, internal um, programming to make sure that uh, our staff is able to capture some of that knowledge that's walking out the door. 
Um, and then we spend a lot of time on outreach out into the community, efforts like our commuter challenge, our future leaders and planning for high school students, which is coming up this May, uh, June. Um, and um, we've done some community service projects, um, recreating an oyster bed in Tampa Bay. Um, just some highlights of some of the upcoming work products. Um, we look forward to be working with Hart and the City of Tampa on the TOD grant that was recently received. Um, in terms of Plant City, we've been uh, we've been working on a mixed-use gateway and updating that language, and look forward to bringing that to a conclusion this year. Um, we've been working with the Florida State Department of Urban and Regional Planning on a shared mobility project specifically looking at how we can frame our land use and urban design differently given the needs of a shared mobility culture. We're working on an Ybor City uh, CRA vision update and um, continuing to work on the update of the county's comprehensive plan, which you have a workshop tomorrow morning with the Board of County Commissioners on that topic. Um, that was just a real quick overview of some of the highlights. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Any questions? Seeing none, thank you, ma'am. Transportation Disadvantage Service update, Ms. Ogilvie. Good morning, Michelle Ogilvie, MPO staff, and let's see. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to give this update. We want to start with key terms, just as an update on, on where we are. It, uh, transportation disadvantage does uh, cast a very wide net, so we are talking about people who are elderly, myself, persons with disabilities, low income and children at risk. We have in this bag uh, community transportation coordinators and a coordinator. The Sunshine Line, who is the operator and overseer of this entire project. We have the Florida Statute for uh, Chapter 427 and uh, Rule 41.2 Administrative Code. All of those things are part of the Transportation Disadvantaged Program. The Hillsborough County Board of County Commission is the Community Transportation Coordinator for Hillsborough County. Each county in, Hills, in the state of Florida has one. The Sunshine Line, again, is the operator. We do door-to-door -to -door service for medical, shopping, employment, job training, and social activities, and provide bus passes to those who are able to use the transit lines, uh, not doing uh, just ADA like Hart does. Our service is Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Just as a, to let you know what, who are we serving? For the Sunshine Line, 56% of the clients are female over the age of 60 who have used the system for three years, who are, um, I read it myself, <laughs> using it for medical programs and uh, are using it more than five times a month. For the Heart Bus Pass system, 77% are female and six, over the age of 60, uh, using it for more than three years, 61% using it for medical trips, and 44% have used it for more than three years. The needs. We have been uh, talking to our board. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Cohen, for having been our chair for so many years, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Vera, for your service as well. Well, we've been talking to those people who provide day-to-day -day trips, um, and these are our needs. Access to work, health, access to food and medicine, access to recreation, a big deal when you think of those who have disab disabilities and need to, their need to see other people to keep their mental health good. That's what we're talking about. Um, school, so the training, so they don't have to be transportation disadvantaged anymore, <laughs> improve their income. Uh, Faith-based activities, therapy, and access to more transportation options, those being uh, a robust um, transit system. Sidewalks, 
street lighting are some of the things that uh, have come up each time we talk to uh, those who are in the business, as it were. And uh, you can see from, I'm sorry, you've seen this slide many times, uh, our robust system is on the right, and that's where we'd like to get to. Uh, please be aware that part of this whole system is looking out, um, and we see that there is a big bubble of persons who are aging. Melissa just talked about people moving out of, yes, <laughs> it is happening. <laughs> Why'd you look at me when you said aging? <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> the dark um, green in here is, is based on the uh, last census 10 years ago where people over the age of 60 were located. We are having a suspicion that as we go into the new census, these people have been aging in place. We see that there's going to be a need, um, which is, you know, it's not really a, a big um, surprise, but we need to be aware that we do have a large aging population that we've not seen before, at least for many centuries. So the service that uh, is, we're talking about is about 2.3 million comes from the state through the Commission for Transportation Disadvantaged. We receive about half a million from the Department of Elder Affairs. The Board of County Commission is very generous, 2.6 million and 52,000 from our fare box, 98% satisfaction. Uh, it ranges between 99 and 98, depending on how many uh, surveys we get each year from the users of the system, with 99% satisfaction uh, with the improvement of the quality of life that this provides, uh, improvements in independence for those people who are using the system, and most importantly is the courteousness of each of the drivers of the system. Moving forward, we have our Transportation Disadvantaged Service Plan, which is going to continue to uh, talk about decreasing road calls. The aging fleet has been a problem that uh, the Board of County Commission is acknowledging and, and has been uh, servicing more brand new buses, so we shouldn't be seeing any problems in performance there. Uh, service, we'd like to have um, demand through 2025, that's dealing with the aging population. We'd like to see an increase in, in uh, service and funds mm -hmm. for that to occur. And I know that Scott Clark and has been working with the administrator, administration for Hillsborough County to uh, raise that level of awareness. And then our big deal is across county trips. Uh, we have a big county, those of you who work in the uh, TMA know, just like everyone else, there are needs for persons with uh, disabilities and so on to get out of Hillsborough County. And this is something that we're working with our uh, regional partners and Pasco and Pinellas. Thank you very much for the quick update and your attention. And in the words of Becky Forcell, who was uh, passed for, with the Ramos in March, rides, rides, rides. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Any questions, Ms. Ogilvie? Oh. Yes, Commissioner Kim. I mean, uh, over when you recognize. I think I, I, I saw that the service is Monday through Friday. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> So, and then one of the priorities that was listed was access to faith-based activities, and we have no service on Sunday? That's correct. How's that happen? <laughs> Do we go to church on Wednesday? <laughs> well, as long as it's before it 5 o'clock. at 5, so we can't do that either. So, so that's why we are. We have a de deficit in some of the opportunities to meet the goals of those that have asked for service. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner can't be recognized. Thank you. Um, just to understand, you're talking strictly about the Sunshine Line here. That is correct. Right. Heart is Heart Plus is Heart Plus is Heart's program, but they're not contractors. They are. They, we have a memorandum of agreement. I see. And so, and then when you're talking about how would it work to do um, cross county? 
So we have been working on that for some time, uh, looking at uh, opportunities that there may be uh, other persons who, providers who maybe have some capacity to provide maybe an extra seat or two in a regular um, defined program, going maybe to Pasco, going into Hills, into uh, Pinellas County, or vice versa. And that's the kind of work that we've been looking at finding. Uh, we've not had much success, but we continue to dig in and find what we can. Uh, in the past, uh, through 5310, which is uh, state uh, federal dollars uh, that um, the FDOT administers, we did have a program called Quality of Life that was an independent provider. Um, and th but they have retracted some uh, in the few years. Uh, that would be another program where you could actually call and, and schedule a trip and get it provided. So we're, we're continuing with that. Just want to always provide uh, awareness that that is a need. And just one more thing, because we rarely talk about the Sunshine Line, but the it's like, it's like a $9 million budget or so? Five. Uh, just I, I think four. It's about in it's most is it predominantly funded through federal and state grants it's funded through state and local state and local do you know the match or anything like that well I just uh, she just put that up there oh I'm sorry I missed right it I'm sorry yes, ma'am I, I guess I can't see the I am so <laughs> sorry 2.3 million from the Commission <laughs> of Transportation 578,000 plus from the Department of Elder Affairs, 2.6 million from the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners, 52,500 plus for Fairbox. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask a question, piggybacking on what Commissioner uh, Overman said. Um, no service on Sundays, and a lot of elderly people said she looked at me. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I could mess with her. She was, she was on staff when I was a, kind of a planning commissioner back in the 80s. And she's still here. Um, the truth. like to go to church. And like, my church is fortunate enough to have the wherewithal to have needs to pick people up and drop them off. What would it take? What would be the, what would you, well, we probably don't have this, but what would it, what would be the cost of us having service on Sunday? Even if it's from 8 o'clock to Three or four. No, we're very lucky to have Scott Clark in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just talking about that. So let me ask Scott to come and give you his. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. Uh, the cost that we would have to pay for uh, additional drivers um, to work on the, on the weekends. Uh, in the past, uh, before 2008, we did do Saturday service for dialysis only. Uh, but with the recession, we did have to cut service. We did have 64 drivers. Now we're down to 48. And um, so we stopped Saturday service. Uh, we tried a pilot to do some more Saturday service, and that didn't go so well. Um, we just couldn't get the, the ridership to continue on with that pilot. Um, as far as the cost, we'd have to figure out what the need, determine what the need is, and then how many resources that would be. Um, so that is part of the discussion, you know, with this new transit tax, that's one thing I asked our, uh, the Transportation Disadvantage Coordinating Board to talk to that committee and include, uh, ask them to include transportation disadvantage in their transportation plans. That's so important. A lot of times transportation disadvantage, the, the people who are least served, um, are rarely recognized because, you know, nor on a, every... A normal day, you know, if we need to go somewhere, we hop in our cars, and it's not a big deal. But someone who's transportation disadvantaged, just that a call from your doctor, hey, you need to get this prescription immediately. To us, we hop in a car, we get there, it's no big deal. Uh, someone who's transportation, that is a big deal, because then they don't have a way to get to the doctor or get there. So um, it would ha we'd have to have a study done to determine what the actual need is. And the same thing for the cross-county trips. Uh, one thing I talked talk to that committee about is you have to determine the need and then the cost and then the return on investment. Um, the MPO did a study in 2016 on a return on investment for transportation disadvantage. For every dollar spent, you have a f uh, $5.07 return for medical and nutrition trips. So. so you said before you did 
You did have service on Saturdays for sure. On Saturdays for dialysis only. Oh, for dialysis only. Dialysis only. Okay, so uh, did that, That's amazing. was that working, did it meet the needs or was it just too, un, was it cost effective? Well, it, it met the needs for dialysis, right. but we, ha we did have to, have to cut that out. So they're still, get, they're still going to dialysis somehow. They're, they're, they're finding a way. Um, they, dialysis have asked to start that back up, but we just haven't had the funding in, in the budget to so, pay for additional drivers. So Saturdays, even though it was dialysis, it wasn't cost effective to you? you was, no. that, that, that was a service that, that we had to downsize because right. we lost the drivers. We were 64 drivers, then we had to downsize down to 48, and we didn't have that capacity anymore to run Saturday service. Okay. okay. But their needs are, are still being met. Uh, they're getting rides somehow. Um, so th that is something we have a new budget cycle. We have new transit tax. These are things that we should explore uh, to help meet the, the needs of the greater community. Commissioner Oldman, you recognize. Um, thank you. I thought of an additional question. What percentage of your ridership is um, wheelchair versus ambulatory? I mean, many, many of the individuals that, that Ms. Forsell fought for were those with vision impairment and other impairments, but they, they could actually ride in a car versus having a wheelchair prepared vehicle. Do you have a, a, the breakdown on the needs of those that have wheelchair needs versus ambulatory needs? Not off the top of my head. For our, for, so for our client base, I can get, we, we serve usually about 7,500 clients a year. Um, so I can get that data based on our client base, but as the county as a whole, I, I wouldn't know that. That would have to be a, a study that would be done. Um, because Sunshine Line, we're, we're not meeting all the needs of the county. We're just meeting the certain needs. A, a lot of people, they don't uh, know about Sunshine Line. Even though last year we've did, we did over 60 outreaches. Uh, we've been on Channel 8 News before. We've been on Spanish radio stations getting the word out. We visit uh, hospitals and different medical facilities like that getting the word out. But there's still individuals out there that, that do have that need. Uh, but it's all, all about funding. Uh, transportation disadvantage service, the paratransit type trips are very costly, but it is definitely needed in the community. Uh, there, there's people that we serve who they can't get in an Uber, they can't get in, in a car. The family may have a car, but they just can't squat down and scooch over into that chair. I do have a letter uh, that we got from one of our clients. Would, I, would it be uh, appropriate for me to read that to you now? Just is, So we get these cards all the time from our customers. and. Huh. I think it's really nice. It says, Dear Sunshine Line, thank you for your service to the Lighthouse for the Blind and uh, back to my home. I was desperate going blind when Sunshine Line was there for me. I am very thankful and will promote you in any way possible. I appreciate your caring. P.S. At 81, I have my life back. I still travel Sunshine Line. Excellent. Thank you. Can I ask one more question or follow-up? Um, do you study what percentage of your ridership actually is using it for employment purposes? And I'm curious, do they all get off before five o'clock? Because well, we we do have a taxi <laughs> we do have a taxi contract for that. It's a small percentage that, that uses it for employment, but we have that contract with the taxi for any after hours employment or for our overflow in case we get we're overbooked or a couple drivers call out and we don't have the capacity to transport we'll send some of those out to the taxi but that's a whole different realm of business uh, we have to really be careful the kind of trips that we give to the taxi company because they don't provide the service that sunshine line does the actual door-to-door -door service uh, where we assist the, the clients to the door of their house. We'll even help them carry the bags. We'll help them unlock their doors uh, because we, we have clients that are 99 years old and they just can't use the keys to turn the lock. And our drivers, and that's why you saw 99% customer satisfaction, um, and they, they provide that additional extra support that they need. And as far as the wheelchairs, in the, I don't know currently, but in the past it has been like around the 10%. Uh, wheelchair users. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ogilvie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Torres, Vision Zero quarterly update. It's okay, thank you. Good morning, 
again, board members, <coughs> Mr. Chair, I don't think you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was good. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Commissioner Kemp, to your sorry, but to your point, um, I wanted to provide this update for this uh, for this very reason. If we needed more uh, justification for why we have Vision Zero program, it's because of this. The dashboard that was associated with the State of the System report, we are not meeting those federal requirements at all. These are not just numbers. These are these are violent, painful, heartbreaking ways of being injured and dying. This is, this is um, a real serious problem, and it's and it's what motivates me to keep going. But it also is it's very. I just I, I get texts. I just got an email that there was another bicycle crash, and I have all these things coming into me, uh, you know, through what I'm working on here that make me not want to give up. And it was thankfully you all uh, had the foresight to. Uh, allow the MPO to take on, staff to take on developing this action plan. And it's hard to believe that it was at the very end of 2017 that this was approved. It's only been a year and a few months, and I'm gonna share with you some of the highlights of things that we've done in that time. Um, and if you remember, uh, some of you may not have been around, but we really focused this on some short-term, low-cost, things that the community can get involved with. Because of your agencies are doing things that cost a little bit more money in your <coughs> programming, other changes and and you know, uh, complete streets redevelopment and law enforcement's doing a great job. But these are some of these other things <coughs> that can elevate because we still are leading the country, and we uh, need to do more. So the four different action tracks um, for future is not like the past. We're looking at uh, policies and standards that we can do that just have a better culture of safety and. We've done a lot of things. We were able to uh, make comments to the DOT's complete streets programs. We've got all sorts of great things. There's LED lights now. We're becoming more you know, a common way of replacing lights on our roadways. The Fletcher Avenue that the county's done, we keep looking at that as this, uh, it's just a great example of the improvements we can see in our crash reduction, and especially the severe crashes. So there's all sorts of great plans going on. Um, that is, the culture is changing out there in our, with our partners. and. With the uh, safety s uh, targets that we set, and you guys, uh, well, you all, sorry, um, remember in January, uh, when we set those targets, we, um, uh, uh, what, I forgot what, oh, I know, we were talking, we were looking at the Fletcher Avenue study and saying, gosh, we can meet our, these goals of these safety targets if we have the ability to, to leverage some of the funding that we have coming toward to us. And Fletcher Avenue, for instance, we could have set five, six to seven of those a year with the uh, surtax uh, funds. And this is where we can start seeing some significant drops. Um, and then we are engaged with the, in the mayoral candidate forum. The Vision Zero was, was there. We had questions. We uh, really got the candidates to think about this topic. Um, consistent and fair is that action track that deals with the law enforcement uh, kind of aspect of it. And um, w the DOT has been giving, it gave $82,000 to TPD and to Tampa Police Department and another 120000 in grants to focus on crash areas where there were vulnerable users were being hurt and killed. Uh, we've also adopted these corridors. Now we have um, a map and I know I have a, I have a version of it uh, later on in the presentation, but we looked at these highest 20 crash corridors and we've been adopting a couple of those and we were able to do some events on 56th Street. We had Temple Terrace and the King High School involved where we um, were waving to motorists and bringing their attention. Those signs have gotten so much uh, life to them. We have, uh, I've been, uh, yesterday or two days ago, I was out on McFarland Park, in front of McFarland Park. The neighborhoods are borrowing those. I bring those to the neighborhoods that say, we might not be on a high crash corridor, but we feel uh, concerned about people in our neighborhoods. And they're out taking this on. Um, 15th Street was another one, and we had done some work there because of uh, different, different problems were there. There were no crosswalks and sidewalks were missing. So we've been doing a lot um, with our, in, um, adopting our Vision Zero quarters through consistent and fair. But right now, um, there's a lot of legislation underway or proposed that it could really help advance the things that we're trying to do. So vision, we're trying to weigh in on some of these things. Um, I think the 
texting while driving becoming a primary offense is, is really significant. I think that has a lot to do with the spike that we've seen in uh, our crashes and our fatalities, is that distracted driving. There's also a couple of other bills out there, um, penalties be increased for people who hurt or kill somebody, uh, a vulnerable ro road user, street racing to become a felony, um, not repealing the red light running cameras. And, I, and we've been talking about this in the coalition. Um, maybe there's a better way, maybe the approach isn't, um, there's a better way to approach it so that's palatable for politically and public wise. There's some, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to red light running cameras is kind of our coalition's uh, take on this. Uh, Paint Saves Lives is a third of the four action tracks, and that is basically let's use low uh, cost things we can do both with paint or just um, e easier to implement kind of things like those leading pedestrian intervals. You may have seen them down, notice them downtown where the pedestrian gets to go f first and then everyone else uh, starts to go through the cycle. And those are being placed, um, more of those are being put in place. The DOT sponsored a traffic box wrap and you can see there was an art contest that was um, approved there. We've done a lot of paintings since, uh, you know, we kicked this off a couple, a year and a half ago. We've done some murals. It's it's effective and it brings the neighborhood out. So it does what we need it to do. People slow down, they start realizing that maybe there's somebody else using this roadway. But I wanted to give a lot of credit to the county and the cities. Um, the county has installed some um, crossings on 50th Street. They had done great work. They put cross, crossings with light, um, pedestrian actuated, but it wasn't enough. There were still, kids were getting killed walking from the you know, apartment complex over the school, so they raised, um, they raised the crosswalk now, so like, like a speed bump, but it's a raised crosswalk. Same thing on Himes Avenue, the, the city's added uh, landscaping, they put some mid-block crossings. There's um, the city of Tampa has the smart paint where someone can sense it in their in their uh, white cane, in their, their canes when they're uh, walking blind and sense that they're in the right location. So there's some really great things going on in that category. The last one is the one message for many voices. That's getting the message out there. That's engaging with the victims. And we have done a lot with creating the, our videos. We've done marches for people who have um, uh, died in traffic. And we have the Gulf Coast Summit. We have one coming up in November. We This is our second one. I've trained lots of people to do speaking engagements. And then we created all sorts of uh, thousands of these um, stickers for people to put on, you know, uh, I break for my neighbors in a certain neighborhood, or I break for a mascot of a certain school. And we do these along the high crash corridors. I've kind of saturated as much as I could on those corridors. We walked for those who died in 2018, and that's going to be, again, we're going to do that in 2019 in November, where we painted shoes white and we marched in silence. Um, with the, those folks in mind, I read out the names, the 169 people who had died um, last year. Uh, we also participated, and you know, this is more significant than just looks like a lot of fun, but you know, here we were at the Martin Luther King Parade, and it has been difficult to make connections in, that, in East Tampa. You can go to a meeting or two, I've gone to lots of meetings in East Tampa, but to, here there were thousands of people lining the road and they were pointing at our signs saying, this is great, they want to take pictures with them, they understood what Vision Zero, what our point was, and that we existed. Uh, we've done some other rodeos. So here's that high crash quarter that we kind of focus, you know, our efforts on. We ask our partners that can make some changes on these roadways to continue to study those, and we will continue to do that. What you're seeing is a heat map of the more recent data. The darker lines were the ones that you were used to create the original action plan. I can start seeing some changes, and I want to dive into that and see what was changed maybe on those roadways. I know that DOT has been doing a lot of work that now maybe we're seeing that the crashes are, are uh, reducing. I, the county and city staff have asked for these layers. They're absolutely committed to working on those high crash roadways. It's embarrassing to see a road in their you know, jurisdiction. They wanna do something about it. Um, so you've seen this, this is, you know, we can do better, but we've done a lot in this year and a half. The coalition is continuing to grow. I think this is really significant. I, I'm having more citizens get involved really active citizens, I'd love for more businesses to be involved and get part of the, uh, we had starting holding quarterly meetings and that's where I would love to see more coalition members commit to doing what, what they can and what we all can. So I don't know if this has answered uh, some of your concerns that 
you know, from the state of the system report, but we have a lot of a lot of work to do. We've done a lot, and I'm moving forward. I have seven years, so I'm not I'm not gone yet. <laughs> 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 so if you have Thank any you. questions, any happy. questions? Your honor. I, I just have a request, Gina. If you could forward um, any of the studies on paint saves lives. Um, I love the concept, but there have been some, I don't even want to call it pushback, questions about do people get used to seeing it and then I'm blind to it and I don't see it anymore. So is there a positive long-term impact or does it change my driving pattern for 90 days and then I'm back to going 60 in a 35? Um, so Check, if you I don't know. I, I haven't looked into that, but <coughs> I would say that you're probably right. I think that probably would happen, but I don't. Think, I think if it saves one or two lives just because it was yeah, there. Yeah, if you have any data or studies, sure. any of the cities that have done that, that would be helpful in our articulating and, and us making some plans going forward. I'd appreciate that. Okay. Mr. Oldman, you recognize. Um, have they, have, has FDOT or anyone given you an update on the three crosswalks necessary on Florida Avenue to avoid the multiple crashes that we've had in the last, say, six months? I have not, I haven't asked specifically. I'm sure that Stephen or somebody from DOT would be happy to provide that update. I mean, I know I mean, it's only been four years. I mean, really, it's, it's, well, maybe three and a half. But we, we, that is a corridor that has a high crash incidence. It seems like every other week we've got crashes at uh, the three locations I had previously identified and I'm I'd not be, seeing any movement at all. I'd be happy to follow up and get back with you or maybe appreciate they directly, but I can do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, you recognize. Thank you, um, and thanks for your involvement. And I can, I just want to say I really appreciate your personal passion in this. I've known you for a long time as, um, even before I got here and your work on, on bicycle pedestrian safety. Um, and, and I can just feel that you um, have this uh, personal passion for this that I think is so important as we you know, look at these numbers of people dying and getting injured um, to understand uh, the, the real tragedy of it and to, and to be motivated by that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you recognize. Thank you. I just want to thank you for your work too and just say it's, I think it's really important to have Vision Zero um, start to be infused with all of us. Um, I have uh, um, said before, in, they in, implemented it early on in New York City, New York City, and they're down to um, cr uh, fatalities of 1910. And uh, it's just, uh, it, they're looking for a, a lot of ways to do it. Um, and certainly, as I stated before, with seven out of 10 of the most dangerous uh, places in America to be a pedestrian or bicyclist or drive a car in Florida. We really need to um, do more. And I would think too, just in terms of, um, I don't know what studies would show or if they even have studies on paint, but one of the things it does is even if it didn't change that area, which I would think it would, but it, uh, it, um, the people that paint it, the younger people being exposed to it, the uh, mindset it changes. Um, and while it might not be an immediate drop, just like maybe the warning label and cigarettes weren't, <laughs> um, it starts to um, become part of the um, culture and thought and, and system. So um, I just I think all of those approaches, big, small, and in between and whatever, are it's all good. <laughs> and it's all important. And it all, I believe, ultimately will um, save lives and make our communities way better places to be. Stars, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Martin. Thank you, sir. And there is an update on the state legislative session uh, in your agenda packet. We also received a, uh, a, a weekly update from the Florida MPO Advisory Council over the weekend. And so copies of that are in your board, board folders. Just a couple of things that I would draw attention to. So in our, our letter to our legislative delegation back in, I think it was in January, we were focusing on safety related initiatives. And so good news, the bills regarding uh, primary enforcement of distracted driving those are moving forward. Uh, also, the bill allowing local governments to uh, safely and appropriately regulate e-scooters, um, those bills are also moving forward. 
Um, so that's good news. Now there is another bill that is, uh, or pair of bills that are moving forward that uh, was not on our radar screen when we talked about this a few months ago, uh, and that has to do with impact fees and what impact fees uh, can be uh, levied by local governments. And that does seem to have some legs to it. Um, I have not dug into that a lot. Uh, as we don't uh, implement impact fees are through the MPO process, um, but it is something that's on our radar screens because we know that it's of interest to the local governments. Uh, our board meeting next month will be on an unusual day, on a Wednesday, and it is gonna be on the second floor, not on the 26th floor, so just a heads up about that. Uh, we have uh, some important business both next month and in June. So next month we are going to be looking at the needs assessment for the 2045 plan. And in particular, the needs assessment for the major projects. So those road widening and extension projects and fixed guideway transit projects. So we're going to zoom in on that part uh, of the long range plan. Where that is right now is we've gotten requests at the staff level from all of the local governments and agencies uh, about project ideas that we can test for congestion benefit, for possible future transit ridership. Uh, and so those are being tested over the next month. The ones that perform well, we will then look at consistency with the comprehensive plans and the community plans. And so that will then be back and be our subject uh, for discussion next month. We'll also next month be looking at an amendment and update to our Unified Planning Work Program, which is the MPO's planning work and budget. And so we'll be looking at a couple of things to true up the grants. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, the requests for use of the uh, the 1% of the county charter surtax and how that might be used by the MPO for planning and analysis activities to support the local governments and the independent oversight committee during the next year, assuming that that is upheld by the courts. So that'll be next month. And then of course in June, we have our public hearing on priorities for the transportation improvement program. So lots of fun things coming up. Um, I will be reaching out to all of you uh, to answer questions individually and talk with you individually about these. Um, and um, the last thing is our, our Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area Leadership Group meeting is coming up this Friday. It's at 9.30 a.m. This one is hosted by Pinellas, so it will be at the Pinellas Sun Coast Transit Authority. The Heights Mobility Plan uh, there's a public meeting hosted this Thursday by Florida DOT uh, at the Seminole Heights Public Library. At the end of this month, April 30th, we will have the second of our open houses uh, where DOT is responding to the MPO board's motions for information about the impacts of the Tampa Bay Next proposals. So again, that's April 30th. Uh, and then one other thing is on June 6th, uh, Port Tampa Bay is offering a tour to board and committee members. Thank you very much to the port for doing that. We are asking for RSVPs on that so that we can make sure that we have enough space. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I have a yes. question for Ms. Alden. Yes. Uh, Beth, I uh, appreciate the report and so forth, but I, I was having a uh, series of meetings with FDOT and a project that I think those who have been on this MPO for a long time have been following for many years has been the widening of 92. And um, I mean, we've had charrettes, we've had all kind of open house meetings. There's been, there was at one time, I think it was $140 million stated for the project. Um, but I understand that uh, right now that that's kind of a dead project simply because <coughs> we don't have that listed as a priority in our MPO. And uh, so if you could look into that, because from meetings with FDOT, they're t saying that that's, they're no longer moving forward with that project at all. Um, and and my, 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 I was told the reason why is because we don't see that as a, as a priority in our MPO. Well, I think there's been a misunderstanding. We'll need to clear that up because I do believe that is a priority both in the TIP and also uh, in the long-range transportation plan. Okay. 
So, so, so then, let's let's talk after this so we can get that cleared up. I would up. love to. Okay, because obviously to me, uh, you know, in East Hillsborough County, the binding of 92 is a major major priority. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on Ms. Alden? Okay. Any old business? Any new business? I wish you can't be recognized. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'd like to um, bring back uh, to the board, I think there's um, some conversation that's actually missing and some expertise. Um, and I'd like to see two seats added to our MPO board. Um, and one seat would be uh, representation from the um, Transportation Disadvantage Coordinating um, Committee. I think it was pretty um, obvious today, but it's been obvious to me that it's, uh, there's um, a lack of that voice um, in um, a lot of deliberations and, um, and issues that we have. The second is the, um, a member from the CAC um, Citizens Advisory Committee of the MPO um, to have a seat on the board, because I think they have a lot of really uh, good conversation and input um, and a lot to um, share with us. And I know that that has been the practice on some other places. And so I think that both of those um, uh, would be well represented and would be important for us to uh, add to our MPO board. What's the process in that? Isn't there, isn't there a process? Let's come. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, board members. The um, first of all, the uh, MPO is redesignated every 10 years after a census. Um, we got one of those coming up. We um, have done this before, though. I um, can't remember how many years ago it was. Not that many. We did. We added a school board as a voting member. Um, there are the, the hurdle is, and, and the process is. It takes a little bit of time because you have to coordinate with the state. Um, FDOT essentially acts as the coordinator for the MPOs, and there's a process to, to, to whether or not it constitutes a significant change, a substantial change, or an insubstantial change. Um, the hurdle would be that in order to have a b voting member on the MPO board, you have to have you have to either be an elected member of local government, so the county and the cities are included, um, or you have to operate a major mode of transportation, which gets in school board obviously because their bus fleet um, it gets in um, uh, the, the uh, port aviation authority other agencies there's also a provision in state statute that allows planning commission to have a member um, I think the hurdle with that would be that the um, those two entities well one is is well they're both subcommittees of the MPO um, but neither one of them meets those two <coughs> excuse me meets those two requirements and there have been um, instances before where entities have tried to add members to M voting members to MPO boards and been advised they couldn't um, include them. I want to say the University of Florida wanted to have a voting membership on the uh, Alachua, on the Gainesville MPO, and that was not allowed uh, because they don't operate, they don't meet either of those two requirements. So I think that would be the hurdle there. Um, I think it could look into whether someone could be included as a non-voting member because there's at least more discretion there, but um, it would probably take some digging. I, I th my first instinct is that for voting membership that that would be a problem because of the constraints of federal and state law regarding MPO members. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, <laughs> I asked him to do that because I figured and knew that there was a long, long list of, a laundry list of things that would have to happen before we would consider it doing that. It's just something that does not happen overnight. Uh, it took us, I think, two or three years to get a school board member on it, if I remember right. So if you're talking about a, a person from the disadvantaged uh, council and from our uh, citizen advisory, and he just outlined that they don't operate any mode of transportation at all, you would have to have a change to the law. And that's not going to be easy. So um, just keep that in mind. I saw hands fly up, but go ahead, Commissioner Smith to recognize. Thank you. And um, I had incorporated uh, some comments in, in my review of the uh, director um, saying that I would like to see more of a voice from the MPO CAC here. Um, I remember that when I was appointed by the board to the EPC's advisory committee, we used to have um, a set time on every agenda for the EPC meetings where a, a spokesperson from our citizen advisory committee would address the board and, and um, give any comments they might have on agenda items um, or, or things that are moving forward 
And we have such a great citizen advisory committee. I, I think we might consider in these future discussions about how to uh, incorporate more of a voice of that rather than just, you know, a kind of a hit or miss in public comment. If there was a assigned um, uh, piece of the agenda to uh, comment from a spokesperson from the CAC, that that might be helpful at least in the interim while we you know, consider any other options. So um, maybe the staff could bring back some suggestions along these lines, hearing from, hearing from the board members uh, on that. Did you see your hand? Um, a good suggestion. I was going to suggest something like that. We have had uh, in, uh, with the committee reports and online comments, there have been previous years where a uh, chairman of our Citizens Advisory Committee has come forward and presented the CAC perspective during that time. And we haven't done that the last few years uh, in, in part because we haven't had anybody on the CAC who's been available to come here at nine o'clock in the morning. And so this is why we've been at the staff level you know, providing a summary of what's going on with each of the committees. That summary does go back to each of the committees so that they can double check that we are accurately carrying forward what their comments and discussion were to the board. Um, but if it's the board's desire to go ahead and hear directly from the CAC and there is a CAC member who's available to come and speak, we could certainly put that back on the agenda. Mr. So Hollingcamp. Pardon? So we have a new member, Mr. Hollingcamp. He'll be able to do that. He'll be able to participate here. So if you need him to. Yeah. Okay. Any objection to that? Seeing none, good. Okay. Any other old or new business? Seeing none, we're adjourned.